All right, I'm going to continue with the UEFI development here. I wanted to get to reading and loading files, at least for the EFI system partition portion of our of the disk image that I'm making for these. I have an ESP and EFI system partition that contains basically the bootloader, this EFI application, and I have a data partition which can have anything. And I'm probably going to put like an example kernel in there and load that. But for this video, I want to see if I can explore the file system of the EFI system partition and read and write files because we have native ways of doing that. I guess native, I mean, if the firmware implements it, we have ways of reading the file allocation table, the FAT file system through EFI. We don't have anything else. I mean, there's block IO protocols, which I'll go into, but this video is probably just going to be the, yeah, this video will probably just be reading the ESP with the file protocols and I'll just have a sort of directory viewer, we'll say. So in the EFI spec, we look at file protocol, I'll be copying these things in, but what we need for a file protocol, what, what is provided, is some, some generic sort of things you'll be familiar with if you're familiar with you know, Unix or Windows, really, any virtual file system. We have open, close, read, write, we have delete, we have flush, if you have caching that it's backed by, I press tab there. <laughs> we have git and set position if you want to read info for a file, or set that info. And that's about it, really. We have extended ones if you want to have tokens and make it more maybe asynchronous or things like that. But basically, to read a file with the file protocol for any of these things, you need to get a file protocol first and pass it in. So there's a sort of chicken and egg issue there. And a file protocol here is that struct, and that's just like an opaque sort of handle to a file in the file system. It can also be for a directory. But to be able to read and open and close and do all this stuff with the file or with a directory, we need a file protocol to start off with. So how do we get one of those? There is an easy way that it provides, and this is all in chapter 13, under media access, there's a simple file system protocol, which is kind of a misnomer since it's not really, it's, it's a simple way to get a pointer, I guess, to the file system, but it's not really a file system protocol itself outside of the name. But what it provides is just one function, really, for open volume. And the open volume call will give you, basically, an EFI file protocol that you can then use to read and mess with directories and files in the EFI system partition. So it should automatically create handles for a block device for the, the FAT file system that I have in the ESP, that any ESP or EFI compliant system should have. So usually this should be supported. If it's not, I guess you'd have to roll your own with block IO or disk IO protocols, but we can use the file system protocol. The only issue with this is that, yeah, the only issue with this, the simple file system protocol where we call open volume on, is that we need to do something. I thought it mentioned down here that you need the handle. I don't remember, but basically you need a handle to be able to call, to be able to get this simple file system protocol. And we have a handle to begin with in the EFI application. But how do you get that into there is the question. So we have an image. Yeah, in the, in the EFI naming scheme and their, in their parlance, we have what's known as an image or a loaded image. So the EFI application, the boot x64.efi, when that's ran, when that's loaded and run, that's considered an image, although an image also includes stuff like the file system attached to that and some other things about, about the disk and the medium and, and you know the platform you're running on and all that. But the loaded image protocol can give you information about this loaded image. So we can basically send this or get this protocol for the image that's passed into our entry point. And among those things that's returned with this is a device handle, and we can use that device handle to load the simple file system protocol, which we, can lose, which we can use to open the volume to the file system, and then use that to get a file protocol to the root directory, and then go through and read files. So that's what I'm going to try to do here. Kind of going backwards with it, but loaded image is what we can start with. And I'll just copy this stuff over probably, as I want to do. It is on, what, 9.1 in the spec here. It's not available from the system table from the boot or runtime services, so we'll have to use something like locate or open protocol to get it. I had issues with locate protocol for some reason. It would return OK, but none of these things were filled out, or at least the device handle wasn't. But if I used open protocol, it was, and it was valid. So that's what I'll be doing there. Let's do 
just want to go wherever I have my, my GUIDs and copy that in there. And we can just copy all this stuff, that's fine, but I'll put this after 7, I guess before 12, I don't know. I get, I'll probably give it up on keeping everything in some fancy word for sorted order. Lexicographic, is that what the, the fancy name is? So we'll just say we have a loaded image protocol, and this is at 2.10 section, was it 9.1, 9.1.1? What's your emergency? I can't read my disk. That's why I'm trying to use this. And I'll just grab the info there in case we have it. So for all of the file protocol sort of stuff that's laid out here, I'm not going to show myself like just copy and paste in code. <laughs> I just basically wanted to show where you get it and then I'll copy it. And that'll be off camera because there's no sense of me recording that after all. I don't know if I have the memory types. I may have to get those as well. But we're given a revision. We're given a parent handle, which for the basically the entry point that we have, it won't really have a parent handle, I don't think. The system table should be equivalent to the system table that's passed in on boot. We have a device handle, which is sort of what device it's attached to, which might be, say, the, the disk that this is running on, we'll say. I don't know for sure, actually. I'm assuming it would be like the disk that the file system's attached to and running on. We have load options that are given with it. We're given how big the image is in memory and where it's at, the type of memory it is, which are just set values. And then we have, I guess, a function if we want to unload the image. So that's there. So some of these things that I'm not going to use are probably set to void pointers. So that's the data that's there. And those are related by, if we go into boot. So the EFI main here, the entry point, the image handle and the system table for this image, we'll say. I mean, it's, it's an EFI application, it's an OS loader, it's an image. Uh, there's too many names for it, but <laughs> we have a handle to this image that's passed to the image. We have the system table, which we can access other system tables like ACPI and things, the boot and runtime services. So this image handle is what we can use to grab a protocol for the loaded image itself, which can contain all this sort of extra ancillary info. We can use that to go to the file system. So that's what I'll be doing. So this is not going to compile because I have stuff I'm missing. And yeah, this references the system table. So I'll probably have to put it after the system table, which is at the bottom. So I guess I'll just put it at the bottom. That's fine. That's fine. Unknown type name. You have a type name. Oh, it's all caps. Yeah. It's because it's all caps. Instead of no cap, it's all cap. As the kids say, device path protocol I don't have, so we'll just say later we can mess with that. That's just going to be a bunch of nodes, really. A bunch of nodes for like ACPI namespaces that say what, what type of devices you have. But it's sort of a, you know, not really a linked list, I guess it's just an array of, of elements, and those elements are device things, and it has a path that describes those things. The memory type we don't have, unload, I'm not going to use. So that also, avoid pointer that sucker. Should just be the memory types, and that is in, I don't remember, something with memory, <laughs> I'm assuming. So probably, uh, it'd be under memory, I'm assuming it'd be under memory allocation, either the first or second ones here. Yeah, the first one there. So allocate pool, which I'll probably be using to load and read files later. It has allocation types and it has memory types. So this is just an enum that says what type of memory you're messing with. If you're going to load files at runtime, which I'll be doing probably in this video, uh, I should have physical address as well. I just want to check that. Yeah, I have physical address as well. But if we want to load and run files, typically it says we need loader I believe loader code or data. In general, OS loaders and applications should, should allocate memory and pool of loader data. Okay, so if you want to load a file from the disk and you want to make a buffer for it, you should use type loader data if you use this allocate pool or allocate pages function. 
you can get errors otherwise, or it might not do what, what you want it to. So I'll just put this above the GUIDs, I guess. Just have the memory types here. But I'll be doing that later on in the video. I guess I could put what section it's in because it's not next to where this is. I can do that, 721. Okay. Just see, all right, so it loads. Of course, nothing, I'm not doing anything with it, but just wanted to get that, that done there. So the loaded image format we have, loaded image protocol, rather. I have at the bottom with all of this stuff. What do I need that for? I need it for the device handle. I'll be doing the simple file system protocol for that, or I'll be using it for that. So I have the loaded image GUID. Let's go ahead and just get that. Let's say for a function, wherever I have those laid out, which is, okay, up here. I'll just add another menu option on the main, the main screen. I'll say read. I might make it read right later. I'll just say read right now. Read ESP files for the EFI system partition. We'll say. Don't know where the underscore is. There it is. If I use my ring finger, not my, not my pinky, it kind of works better. Okay, so there's nothing for that function. That's all right. Just have that here. EFI status is what I'm returning. Yeah, and I'm not taking in anything. All right, just to make sure that we get a menu option on the screen. Okay, and it doesn't do anything. But all right, so let's get the loaded image protocol. So I'll say for, for this image itself, I guess I'll say application itself. In order to get the device handle to use for a simple file system protocol. I'll just say for the simple file system protocol. Okay. So I'll have a GUID value. I guess I'll call it lip loaded image protocol GUID. And that will be the EFI loaded image protocol GUID because I'll use that in terms of open protocol. It needs a GUID. I'll just copy other code I have for that. Because I'll be using that in a second. I'll have EFI status. Status that I'll use to check for error things. So I need the protocol itself, or at least the pointer to it that I pass to this. So loaded image protocol itself. I'll call it just loaded image protocol. Or lip. And the handle buffer, so what handle do I give to open protocol here? Well, I only really have one handle that's, well, right below where I was. I only really have one handle that's here in main, the image handle. And I set that to image at the top, I believe. Yeah, I just call it image here. I could probably give that a better name, but right now it's just image. I should change that later. That's okay. So that's a global, so I can use that here. That's just for the overall image itself. The GUID I'm looking for is going to be this loaded image protocol GUID. The memory that it, that it should fill out with that loaded image protocol is going to be the loaded image protocol itself that I have, this variable here. The image I can also use is just the, the containing image for this. I don't have a sort of driver thing container for it, so that's fine. Um, I'll set the status. I'll just default it to success here. Just so it's a little less off the page. Okay, and then we'll open it by handle protocol. That's fine. And of course, for error handling, we can just say if it was an error status, then I'll print an error in return. That'll be all right. So standard error. Say error could not. I'll put the percent %x for the status as well. Could not open. Loaded image protocol for, well, I'll just say could not open. That's fine. Could not open loaded image protocol. Give it the status. And 
and I'll return one or failure or something. I guess I'll just return the status. Yeah, because it's not success. Okay, been a little while since I've done one of these, but that's all right. So if we got that, then we're good. I'll just determine if we got it by doing nothing, getting a key press, fprintf needs a u there. And I don't have an fprintf actually. I have, what is it, e for error. I don't need to do standard error. So I just said I forgot. I haven't done this in a while. Okay. <laughs> I have eprintf. All right, so this should do nothing if I got it right, and it did nothing, but it took a key press, so that's good. So I could probably clear the screen first as well. I'll just do that. So that's C out, clear screen, given C out. So it shouldn't do anything, but give me a blank screen until I put a key in, except for the time on there. Okay. So we have the loaded image protocol that comes partly with a device handle that I can use for the simple file system protocol. So I'm going to add that in, and that is at 13.4.1. I had stuff at section 12 before too. Somewhere, it doesn't matter where I put it. I don't know why I keep worrying about things. Just put it below here. Simple file system protocol, pretty simple. Just gives you one thing. 13.4.1. And that one thing is opening a volume. I'll get that first. And I'll just grab the revision, why not? I don't necessarily like doing this underscore stuff because it doesn't help with circular dependencies anyway. But it's kind of a sign that I'm going to have them because open volume probably, probably returns or needs one of these. And this defines open volume, so they're kind of circularly dependent like that, which is not great, but okay, let's put this down here. Change it to where I have that, okay. So we got the specs, what does this do? Really, devices that support return an EFI file protocol, which we need for the EFI file protocol functions themselves. Closed by closing all open file handles, so it opens a file handle to the root directory. That's what open volume does. I'll grab that as well. Since this needs that defined, I have to put it first, but it needs the file system protocol defined. So I'll put that before here too. Just to get the forward declarations there. Okay, so we give it this, we give it, a, we give it a pointer to where we want a file protocol to be filled out for root, so it even calls it root because it's meant for the root directory, so that's not too bad. Okay, so we can do that, so we can call open protocol on that as well. Open protocol comes with a closed protocol, which I think I've used before, but maybe I haven't. I haven't filled that out, actually. I should fill out closed protocol and probably close things that I've opened so far. <laughs> that's, that's not good. It's not good at all. I have a feeling I know what this is. It's very simple, but I still want to look at it. Because I'm a lazy, lazy person, and I can just grab it like that. And the clipboard is on my mouse and not on Vim's. Just paste buffer, so slightly different there. Okay. Closed protocol takes in a handle, the protocol for that handle, the agent handle, and a controller handle. We're not doing with controller handle because I'm not writing drivers. I can just give it the image handle of the UEFI application itself. Okay, so just the overall, the global image one I have. Protocol can be the protocol we're closing. Handle can be the handle that the protocol was opened on. And if these are just for the image handle, then that's okay. This is on 7310. Just thought of that, so all right. I'll just do I'll do that at the end. What I did before was if I end up having nested loops, which I probably will, I'll just have a cleanup sort of tag here, a label that we can go to. 
and not abuse because that would be considered harmful. So we'll just do some cleanup at the end before we leave. I like this as part of, in my work for RPG, it has uh, it basically defers, which you can give a section in any procedure, which in this case is like a C function. And it has stuff like on exit, which is basically a label, but it kind of works like this where whenever the function exit exits, it runs the code for on exit. So I wish C kind of had something like that. It's pretty nice for like a defer-esque way of, uh, of control flow. But this is kind of a bad sore attempt at that. <laughs> I mean, C has at exit and stuff, but it's not, it's not per function, you know? It's not that granular. But anyway, we can call BS on that close protocol just for cleanup here. So we're given the image. I can give the protocol, which would be the GOID. If we open loaded image, I should close that when I leave, so I'll do that. Agent handle can also be the image. I'm not doing drivers, so the last one can be null. Okay. Let me just make sure that that's right and it's not. Simple file system. I did mean protocol, probably. 678. I should finish one thing before moving on, of course. This is like down here, this. If I simple file system project, I mean, that's defined. And it's defined here. Right? That seems okay, but it doesn't like that. Simple file system. Oh, I missed the, uh, <laughs> I missed the underscore there, or the spec didn't have an underscore. That's pretty easy to miss. Unknown type name file protocol. Okay. Because that returns a file protocol. So let me... Also define that. That is in 13.5.1. Revisions, I guess I'll do. I'll put it above here, probably. So 13.5.1. I copied this already, but let me copy it again. Miss the initial hash. And we'll take in this whole thing. Which I said I wasn't going to show on camera, but, you know, I guess I'm doing that, so. <laughs> As I go along, we find stuff we need to define, and then we define it at the point at which we need it defined. So, that's all we're doing. These are added for revision 2. I don't really care about them, but that's fine. I'm not going to use them. But they can be useful. The EX1s in general... In the UEFI spec, the EX functions do the same things as the other ones. Say we end it flush, just so I can look at it. It's before file info, I thought. No, is it after? So it defines these in weird ways. Okay, they're before that point in the spec. All right, I figured it'd be in the same order that it defined them in the struct, but that's not true. Why would that be true? <laughs> So the difference with the EX versions are they have a token. The regular ones don't have a token, I believe. If I just go to open. This file handle name mode and attributes. Yeah, they have a token that's associated with them, which is a file IO token for a transaction. If you want non-blocking IO, the event will not be signaled. If the call succeeds, it will be signaled upon completion of the open. Okay, so you could make something that's called for a transaction level event or for like a sort of event system in general, and it will let you know when it's done. So asynchronous or non-blocking I.O. could be used here. That's interesting. That's interesting. I guess I'll just be using the regular blocking I.O. versions, but that's, that's fine. They're usually pretty fast. But anyway, if we need file IO defined, then we need all these other things defined too, which is kind of not great. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so I guess I'll do that. So I know I at least want open, close, read, and write, and probably get info. If you have stuff that you know is going to be cached, you might want flush just to ensure that it's written to disk when you're done. Set position I don't really need unless you're setting a directory to zero or you're setting a file to zero or the end of it. So actually, yeah, we probably do want getting in set position because that's our seek operation. Yeah, set position would be the seek operation. 
and then just open, close, read, and write or self-explanatory delete is to delete a file. We don't have rename, but that would be with set info, most likely we'd set a new name with that. So you can make something fairly full featured here if you want, but I'm just going to copy all the, the type defs for these functions and I'll be back in a minute because <laughs> that's just going to be like three minutes of me doing nothing but copy pasting. So see you in a second. All right, I got everything copied over for the file protocol, everything except the ex functions, which I'm not going to implement. But I just put them all over in my header file, I had to type def it to itself, of course, because it takes in the protocol itself. So open and all their, their fancy bits. If you're creating a file when you do open with mode create, then you can use these attribute bits in the attributes int here, the uint. Otherwise, you won't need to use them, so I probably won't use them unless I'm going to write files in this video. We'll find out. But you can make them hidden or system or reserved, which is interesting. Open for read only if it's created, I guess. Open it for read would, I think, imply read only. Uh, we can make a directory directly. <laughs> I think that's the only way you can make a directory or an archive, which is also interesting. I think. Doesn't really explain those, does it? No. Uh, the other thing with open is this text is a little messed up because it doesn't show the slash because escape characters are fun. But <laughs> if you open a file from a directory, the file protocol for that directory determines the path that you would give to open. So if you open something that's nested a few directories deep from where you're currently at, then you would have that with a slash in the path, except since we're in like C, the C strings have to be escaped, so you'll end up with a double slash, and that's probably where they had some formatting issues here. But other than that, I'll probably just read through a directory, and if we open something in that directory, since it's relative to the location of this, we won't really have to worry about it. We can just pass it the name itself, but we'll see how we want to deal with that. A close is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, that just closes a thing. Delete deletes it and closes the file handle. Read depends on if you're in a directory or not. So it reads the bytes from a normal file, how normal, let's say, syscall write works, or f write, if you will. It works pretty much like that, returns the amount of bytes that are going to be read up until the end of the current file. If it's a directory, it reads a directory entry and returns that entry in the buffer. And the entry for that is in EFI file info. So if I go to file info, which I didn't put over here, uh, it gives you information about a file, and this is a directory entry as well for EFI, for these protocols, for the file protocol. This info is the directory entry. So as, as opposed to like the normal fat, a short or long name directory entry. So file name here is also sort of the VLA, kind of. So I'd have to do, for something like this in C, I would have to do like heap allocations. I don't want to deal with that, so I've seen other people online just set a fixed size for this. So I'm just going to set a fixed size, 256. We could look at this later. I'll say maybe to do change to, let's say, dynamically allocate memory for these, question mark. But it's just easier if I set it to 256. And if we're only dealing with fat file systems, the name, unless you're dealing with a really long name entry, it's not really going to reach that point, hopefully. Um, and it won't be qualified, I don't think. It shouldn't have the slashes and previous directories for it. It'll just be the file name itself. So really, hopefully we don't have any super long files, but I'm not going to be where, what I'm dealing with. But the file info for a file will get the size, and this size includes the whole thing. So you'd have to read the entry itself and then get the size, and the size would be basically this information plus however big the file name is. So you could find that out because this is a fixed amount of data. Uh, EFI time, I've done before from git time. So yeah, that includes year, month, day, hour, minute, second, nanosecond, time zone, calculations, and stuff for that. The attribute bits, what are the attributes for this? Um, that would be in file info, which I didn't go and look at. Attribute bits are, well, I have them right below because I can't read, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we have read only if it's hidden system or directory. Everything from the, the create flags for the create function that we have. Basically, those attribute bits. Valid attribute, I guess, imposes or encompasses all these bits below this point. 
sort of like a, a final enum value. File system info is also something you can give to this is this is for like the git info calls is file info and file system info as well. If you call git info for a file, you should retrieve the file info. But if we use it for the file system because we need a, a GUID for the git info call, then you can get info on the file system itself or the volume. So this should give us info on the ESP if you want to read that. I'm assuming this would just be for like the root directory. I think that's the only directory in a FAT system, FAT file system that can have a volume label. Other than that, it'll give you the overall size and free space and block size and things. So if you want to mess with more like FAT drivers and, and user space or whatever, however you want to call it, you could, you could mess with this. But, uh, the only annoying things was they define their GUIDs as just ID, and then they put it in a slightly different format. So I just formatted theirs to be like my other ones were. I separated out the bytes a little and just made it consistent, but that was a little a little fun trying to figure out with compilation errors. But anyway, the other stuff I think is fairly self-explanatory. Get and set position will get and set a position. They put set position first. The differences between like the regular sort of fseek style is that if you seek to basically the end of the file, you do it by setting all Fs for an 8-byte value. So this is 16 Fs, and that'll set to the end of a file. With the exception of that, only absolute positioning is supported, and past the end of the file is allowed, a sub subsequent write would grow it. That causes the current position to be set to the end of the file, except if it's a directory and not a normal file, which you would check the, the attributes bit of file info. Uh, you check the attribute bit here and like and it with file directory to determine if it's a directory. Other than that, if it is a directory, you can only set a zero position and that would be like rewinding a directory. It would start over at the beginning to read the directory entries. Get position returns a position, self-explanatory. So I guess for a directory, it would return the directory entry. The current position has no meaning. Okay, so you don't really want to use it for directories. You'll get an error. And then get and set info will get either the file info or the file system info, depending on the GUID you pass into it for the information type. It'll return that in a buffer. You can pass it info about the buffer as well. And set info should be able to set information, which is interesting. So I suppose you would, you would make a struct of say file info, you change some values inside of it. So you could get info for a file, change values, and then you set info with that, with that file info struct as the buffer. I'm assuming is how this would work, unless it's read only. You can change the attribute field. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it would work. Okay, that makes sense. I don't think I'll be messing with that, but that makes sense. Um, I can always do it on another video as well. So, okay, that's a brief overview, not really explaining, but just, you know, their functions here. So, <laughs> where was I at? What did I want to do? I closed the loaded image protocol if we return to our rights. Otherwise, we have it open. So, from the loaded image protocol, if you remember, because I don't, get my keys working again if I use the mouse within this sort of index thing. Uh, it was all up there. If I don't deal with loading memory right now in the loaded image protocol, we're given, among other things, a device handle, which I can use as the handle to open the simple file system protocol. So that's what I'll do. So let's say git system, git simple file system protocol for device handle on this or for this say for this loaded image a lot of redundancy here that way I know where, exactly where I'm at open the root directory for the ESP so I do similar things here except the GUID value would be the simple file system uh, GUID I have simple file system protocol GUID. Instead of LIP, I'll do just what I was doing. Simple file system, SFS probably. 
sys loaded image protocol, do the simple file system protocol. Simple file system, SFSP. That's fine. I could set these to null or something, I guess. Doesn't matter right now. I guess I could. Just so they all have initial values. All right, so now I can't use memset because I don't have that defined anywhere or I'm not linking in the system standard libs anyway. It's okay. Let me move this off for a second. So I can open it on there so I can call open protocol. I have a lot of similar looking code with errors and everything here, but that's all right. Just put that there. So we can go open protocol, not on the image, which is the overall global handle, but on the device handle for the loaded image protocol, assuming it opened all right, which it did at this point. So I can dereference that pointer, get the device handle as the image, as the, yeah, as the image handle to open this protocol over, give it the simple file system, GUID and pointer there to open. Image is the overall system image, so I'll use that still. The agent handle or whatever, and the controller handle, I won't do it. And we'll open it, and okay, we'll say could not open. Simple file system protocol. If we got to this point, then we're good. I suppose I could print other stuff, though. We'll just say here, just for testing purposes. And yeah, I'm not using cleanup yet. Okay, so that works. That's said here. So then we can use that simple file system protocol. We can call open volume. On that, I believe. So we use loaded image. An open volume probably takes in this, yes, and it returns a file protocol as root, it returns a double pointer file protocol. So, okay. Let's so open root directory via open volume. So we'd call open volume on that. We need a file protocol. So let's do EFI file protocol. It needs a double pointer. We can give it a single pointer to fill out. And that'll be the file protocol. I don't know, FP, EFP. I guess that'll be file protocol. It'll work like a file pointer, so that kind of makes sense. It'll be root, though. So we could call it root. We could call it something else. We could call it directory, because it'll be like a directory pointer. In this case, pointing to root. So I guess I can try that. And we can give a an address for that, because that'll be file protocol double pointer. And that should be all I need. That's all I need, okay. And we'll just say, if we don't have an error, we'll still put here. If we did, we'll see what it is. We'll look inside and see what it is. So we could not open, open volume, I guess. I'll just say could not open volume. root directory all right we got that all right okay so what do we do with that root directory well we can read it so i'll just print the stuff to the screen right now let's say print directory entries i'll change this in a little bit i'll just put print directory entries i guess until i change it however i want to do my labeling here so for the read call in the file protocol, yeah, for read, if I file read, if it is a directory, not a normal file, we read the directory entry and return the entry in buffer. If the buffer is not large enough, we get too small. And buffer size is set to the size needed to read on success. We get the next directory entry that it'll be pointing to. And it returns a zero length buffer when it's done. No more entries. So the input size will be zero when, in there, when there's no more entries. If it's not zero, we have something. And EFI file info is the structure returned in this buffer as the directory entry, or we get these errors. So we can mess with that. So we will have file info as a buffer, as just a void pointer. Okay, so we can just make a struct there. Let's call it info. That's fine. Maybe file info would be a better name. We'll do file info. And we have the volume open on the directory pointer. So we can say directory pointer read, because we opened it from open volume. We should probably close it when we're done, like with cleanup. We should close the other protocol as well, which is 
simple file system protocol. I'll make sure that's closed. I could do it in reverse order like a stack. It doesn't really matter. Except that wouldn't be on the image. That would be on LIP device handle. And this would be simple file system protocol. Okay. Just make sure they're closed. Uh, since we open the root directory, closing all the open file handles should close it. Or we can directly call close. I guess we could directly call close instead, though. That'd probably be okay. Just call it the close itself. I think that's how that works. Yeah, it just gets this file handle to close. That should be all right. Dirty data will be flushed. Okay. Unless there's asynchronous IO, it'll wait. So I'll say close last open directory, assuming we go nested. Close open protocols. All right, so I want to read the directory pointer. I don't have all these things memorized. So we give it, so we give it a file protocol. We give it a buffer size and a buffer. So this will be the buffer. The buffer size will be whatever we want. So let's say uint in buffer size. And that'll start off as size of file info. We'll pass that in. It's just, it is a pointer. So we pass in the address and the address of file info. And assuming that's okay, we should get something out of that. Otherwise, the size will be zero. So let's say while buffer size is not zero, then we'll read additional entries. We've gotten at least one, so at the end of the loop, I'll just read another one. We could probably make this a for loop somehow, but that's fine. Okay, so let's just say we got the next directory entry. I'll just print the info for it here. Could also print like a title for the directory, which is how I did things before. Let's say I do that as well. So I'll say whatever directory we're currently in, I'll print at the top, and then the entries will be underneath it. Uh, so yeah, I'll do that. I can make this. 256 as well. That'll be all right. And I don't have mem sets. I could just set it equal to something. I don't have a string copy either, but that's easy to add. So I could start adding in like library functions. That wouldn't be too bad. U16 versions, I guess. We'll start at root. I'll just put a to-do there to read that. So we don't, I don't have a string copy because it's in string.h. I'm not doing that. That's all right. Um, instead of returning status here, I'd probably, well, I'd probably return it here, actually. Because I set it to EFI success to start. Yeah. Okay. So then in these, like, in these errors after the first one, I can just go to clean up instead of returning. And that should clean up everything. Assuming... I guess assuming the directory is closed, I could have, um, I want to make this interactive where you interact, you, you can go in and in and out of directories and like read files. I want to try to go towards that. And if you press like escape, like I've done with everything else, that'll be a close out of everything option. And that can close an open directory. So actually right now I can do that and we'll do that later or an escape option. Okay. So string copy. I'll just add that in at the top. I should make another file to put stuff in anyway. Like these helper functions, but that's all right. So let's say string copy. I'll do you went 16 string copy. So I'll say string copy and u16 maybe. I'll just do that so it differentiates it. That'll be all right. So string copy does this, it returns what dest, right? Yeah, okay. Except we're doing char 16 T versions. So I can make them constant and restrict. That would probably be good. Although, I don't know, the amount of optimizing that will be done is not enough for my program to really matter. To be honest with you, but that's all right. Uh, 
So this is going to be copy source string into dist return dist. Yeah. So we probably can do that. So how would we implement a simple string copy off the top of my head and not looking at the example that they did with string p copy, which calls mem p copy? Can do while, well, while source, we do need to copy that into dist. And if this doesn't exist, that won't be good. So I guess I can add some simple things there. If there's not dest, it'll be, you know, that's bad anyway. Uh, say if not source, return dest. So while source, I know I want to have that equal. We can do it like this, but then dest would be messed with. So let's say we'll have a result and that'll equal the destination. We'll set everything equal there with the standard C way of doing that. And then we'll return result. While there is stuff at source, put it into dest, increment both pointers. That seems all right. I called it U16. Okay. Of course, I can print that out if I want to test that. So it would be current directory. And then, yeah. I'd print all this other stuff out. Okay. Let's see if that works. Say hey, current directory, that's exactly what I put. Yeah, I meant to do. <laughs> I know what I meant to do. I just didn't do it. It's a string, of course. At least we know at least we know printing works. Okay, it's got a space there. Interesting. I guess I'm not doing the null byte, so that's probably bad. Yeah, I should end it with a null. That's true. I think string copy does that by default. So I'll do a U16 version of a null. Which I didn't do in my 32-bit OS. So I need to add that in. I put a to-do for that, I think. String copy should null terminate the string. Okay, there we go. Sorry, you probably can't see that. I just realized that, that crap's like tiny as everything. Yeah, there's a little, it's just a slash. Sorry, I just realized you probably can't see that. I'll probably <laughs> zoom things in and, and editing. But anyway. Anyway, we got the directory info. Hopefully within this file info thing. So we can look at file info and the, the stuff therein, which in this case would be file info, this struct. So we can look at stuff in there if we want. I'm going to say, I want to know if we're looking at a directory or a file. Let's print some stuff about that. I'll have a string that says directory or file, and I can have the name. We can print other stuff like the size and the times. I don't really have like a width specifier, but if you want to print the size and the time, you can do that. I'll probably just print the directory and the name to have this be a, a shorter video here. Print one per line. And it will be, let's say, file info dot attributes. If that is anded, if it is a directory, it would be anded with the EFI file directory bit. Just put one per line, I guess. If that is true, let's print a string that says directory. Otherwise, I'll have one that reads file. And that is one extra, so I'll put a space on there. So that's what. That's six characters versus five. Okay. Then for the other one, I'll just print the name. And the name would be file name. And that should be null terminated from the EFI protocols. It doesn't like that. Why don't you like that? Oh, because I need a, a colon there, not a <laughs> comma. That's at the end. Yeah. Ternaries, they're always fun. Okay, so I'm just printing if it's a directory or file and a file, and then we'll read another thing. If there is a buffer size, we we got another entry, so I'll just print the info for that entry. However, whenever we read, we do need to reset the buffer size. I guess I can leave that out, and we can see what happens. We'll get some errors, probably pointer type mismatch, because I don't have a U for UTF-16 literals. Okay, so we read. 
And if I press Control F, it counts as a key, it goes back. But I read EFI twice, and then NVVARs. There's only one thing, there's only one file in my root directory I know when I build my default file image, and that's the folder and the file here. That file is added by OVMF. So, but there's only one EFI directory, so why is it printing twice? It's because we effectively sort of read, uh, we read the next thing, but it doesn't count as reading the next thing. It's kind of weird. But the, the issue is that we need to set the buffer size every single time we read because it's an input and output parameter saying how much data we want to read. So I don't put anything in. It probably reads file info amount of data, but it's not really correct. As, as you saw, it gives duplicates. So if I reset it every time, it'll actually say, okay, I want to read the correct amount of data. Oh yeah, yeah, because it returns. <laughs> because since buffer size is also an output parameter for read, it returns the actual data returned, and the file name is a variable size of data. So if it tries to read that same variable size and it doesn't work, it might get an error. But we go and read it again, since we still had a buffer size, and it gets the actual right directory, and then we write the actual thing. So that's why there's a duplicate there. But if we just set the right size every time, that should fix that right up, and it does. We get EFI and NVVARs, non-volatile variables. Now that's not a text file, it's a binary file. We could still try to, try to print it, but anyway, what I want to do is try to be a little bit more interactive if we want to go into the file system and see what else is there. So I'll say we do that. So let's say print directory entries for currently opened directory. We'll start at root. And we'll do that to start off with. But if we read something and it is a directory, we'll, I'll say we can get data. So we'll have to clear the screen. So instead of doing it up here, I'll do it within there because everything's good. Get next info. Hmm. Try and think how I want to do this. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it within probably maybe an overall loop actually. So I want to, I know I want to clear the screen and I'll print the directory entry. So let's make an overall input loop. I'll do start at root directory, put that here. This is not a good way of doing it, of course. But that's all right. Clear the screen, print that out. Similar to how I've done other input loops here. We're going to read everything till it's done, then we'll get input and go off what we read. So I'll do that. So it's key, no, input key, yeah. So we'll get a key here. And I'll switch on that, which would be, I need to name it something. <laughs> we can switch on the Unicode character, the scan code. Let's switch on the Unicode char. Unicode char. Which I think I can put that directly within the switch and it would be scoped to the switch. So I can do if I input key equals get key. Then I could switch on the character. No, I'm not going to be fancy. Never mind. I'm trying to think ahead of myself. Let's do, well, actually, let's do scan code. <laughs> All right, because if I do scan code, I have scan codes defined at the top for these at least the up, up, down, and escape, which I can go off of. So I do scan code escape, we press the escape key, I wanna go back, so we can do like leave, or we can do go to cleanup. Go back to main menu, I'll just say exit, exit I guess. Exit and go back. Else we'll have up or down arrows. Which for those I want to probably highlight the row I'm on just so we have a visual indicator where we're at. And then if I press enter, I probably want to go into that directory. I suppose if it is a directory. So I'll do that here. Say so if key dot, this time I'll use Unicode because then we can say if it's a carriage return, which is the enter key, UTF-16 version. And we can do stuff, do stuff on there. Process enter key, so up and down arrow. I'm going to move up and down on the screen visually. 
and we can print out the stuff that we did already. Not doing this loop in a great a great way right now. <laughs> Stream of consciousness is not the best way to do input loops. Uh, let's say we have an int. Let's say I have a cursor row that I'm on visually. Actually, I'll set it to one because we're going to be row zero is going to be the directory. After that, we'll start printing directory entries. So we'll start at the first one. Then I can highlight it, print it out, and de-highlight it. That's what I remember doing. So say we'll say if the cursor row is whatever row the hardware cursor effectively is currently on, which would be our console output mode cursor row. Yeah, there we go. So after we print this directory entry at row zero, we'll be on row one, because that'll be after we clear the screen, it'll be set to zero. So we print out current directory, we're on row one, because we have this new line here, and I'm starting at one, so I want to highlight that first. Okay. So if we equal that, highlight row cursor, user is on, and that would just set, I think it's set attribute for the text mode, yes, and this would be highlights, yeah, highlight foreground and background. Or however I did that. If I text attribute, let me just copy that. <laughs> All right, and those are my these are my own macros here, which are at the top is blue and cyan. Okay. Go back in the jump list. There we are. Okay. Yeah, so I'll we'll highlight, I'll print it, and then I'll de-highlight. Of course, after I print, I'm going down a line. So I can say either we're, le we're equal to the row minus one, or I can say row plus one is equal to the row. Uh, yeah, I'll say de-highlight. De-highlight row after cursor. I'll say rows, because by default, they won't be highlighted, so that's okay. So these ones would be default for my stuff, so I don't highlight them. Okay. So it should highlight the EFI folder, write it, and then set the normal colors, get the next one, NVVARs. It should not be highlighted, this won't run, but it will print it, and then this won't run. According to my laws of substitution, then I press the down arrow and everything breaks, but you know, it did do that. So it highlighted the first one there. Okay, so up and down. I'll say we'll just move the cursor row. So if row is above zero or above one, because one is the highest we can go to, I'll just increment that. For the down arrow, I probably want to limit it to something. So let's say we have the number of rows here, number of entries even. Should probably limit that. Let's do it, I guess, here. That'll be zero. I can put it above. That's fine. Number of entries will be zero. If we got an entry, then the size is above zero, so I can increment that. Then down here, we can say if we're below the number of entries, then we can increment. Increment would go down. In this case, I want to do minus. If we go up, we go minus down to zero for the y. The row number, if we go down the screen, we increment the row number. So I'll try that. And then what? So it'll go back to switch, it'll go back up, clear the screen, draw it again. We'll see how that does. Uh, it just erases it, really, which is not great. It's probably how I'm doing my clear screen, I guess. Not sure why it would keep doing that. Why would you do that, I wonder? I could reset the cursor row. Well, I don't need to, though. Probably need to reset where the directory is at. That might be the issue. Setting it here first is okay, but I guess when I'm reading, maybe it's bad. So yeah, that's where I would call probably set position on directory every time it reloads. That would probably be good. Yeah, I should be doing that.
where it said set position for the current directory that's being opened here. I'll set it to zero. That would rewind a directory. Reset to start of directory entries. Then I do that, but for size is set every time. Okay. That may be part of it. Okay, yeah, that was it. All right. I was just freaking out at that point. So now if I try to go down below, it doesn't work. If I go try to go above there, it doesn't work. So I've bounded the sort of user cursor within these two functions. So now, oh, well, within these two entries. So now if I press the enter key, I want to do something. Let's say for a file, we can read it to screen. If it's binary, it'll just print probably garbage, but that's all right. And if it's not a file, if it's a directory, we can go into that directory. So that's what I'm going to do next. All right, so let's continue on here in this loop. I got some more water. Hopefully I'm refreshed a little bit. So on the enter key, yeah, and the input down here, process the enter key. Let's say on a directory, what do I want to do? <laughs> say for, for a directory, say enter that directory and iterate the loop. Just put that on. On the second line, okay, for a file, say print the file to screen. That's reasonable. I don't have like a scrolling driver or anything. Like I don't have shell history, we'll say, for this. <laughs> I don't have screen history, so I won't have like page up, page down to read previous file contents. But if it's short enough to fit on screen, it'll I'll at least have an example for that, for calling the read and close functions and stuff. So. Print the contents of the file. Print the file contents would be proper grammar there to screen. Okay. So how do I do that? Well, we know we have the file info. We can check if it's a directory or not by checking this. I was looking for that line. Yeah, check if it's a directory or not. However, we need to get the right directory entry since every time I redo this loop, I kind of redraw everything from the top down, starting at the first entry because I reset the position right here. So I reset it and I draw, so I'm going to have to reset and draw again according to where the user is at. And it'll reset when the loop goes back through, so that's okay. So let's reset to start of directory entries. Let's do this. We'll get, uh, get directory entry under user cursor, which will be the cursor row. User cursor row, we'll say. We'll reset to the start. And I'll just do the reads again, which that's all scoped to this loop, so that should be available. Okay, so I want to do, I want to read at least one entry and stop when we're at the row. If the row is one, it'll stop immediately. This would be a good candidate for a do while loop. We don't have to use one, but you know, I'll use it. Say we have a row, well, we'll I need to go until the user's cursor row, so I can do that. So I'll see out. See out mode cursor row is less than, I guess. Yeah, less than would work. Less than the user's cursor row. We'll read in the next thing with file info here. So the user row won't be changing. Except when we go back here, we'll probably reset it, won't we? Yeah, I'll, I'll just reset it to zero when we're done switching directories. That'll be all right. I'll reset it to one. First entry in new directory, we'll say. So I think this would work here. We just keep reading until we get it. So if we're at zero, we'd read one time here. And if cursor row is one, we'd equal one. All right. So then I want to open that new directory. If it's a directory. So let's test that. So if file info dot attribute, or is it attributes? No, just singular. So if it's a directory, say it's a directory, else it'll be a file. 
or I can iterate the loop, I guess break would be switch, so it would go down to there, yeah. So that way I don't have to nest necessarily, we'll just continue at the end of that. Okay, what do I want to do in here? I'll just say else this is a file prints contents. Okay, so to open a directory, we'll call open wherever our current directory pointer is. I can make a new, we'll need a new file directory thing anyway. We file open. So we need this, we need a new handle for the file protocol that we're returning. So let's make EFI file protocol and we'll say it's a new directory. So new directory, give a reference to that, a pointer to that. The address there, the file name will be whatever file name we have in the info. So that would be file info dot file name. So we don't have to do a sort of qualified path if I'm opening it from this current directory. So that's, that makes it a little bit easier there. We have the open mode. I'll just open it for reading. It'll be a directory. So I put these all on a line so I can fit them on screen. If I file mode read, and then we have attributes don't matter unless you're creating something. So we can just do nothing for that. And I'll just send a zero because I'm not going to be making it. I'm just going to be reading it. Okay. Could set a status on that as well, I guess and just check the contents. We should be able to open it regardless, but I guess I'll check the status on that. Might as well. Just wanna copy, copy my code, because I'm lazy. I didn't copy the if, eh, it's all right. Okay, I also could not open. Not open new directory percent s. Then I'll go to cleanup, that'll be all right. So the directory would be info file name, and the status would be status. Okay, if we did succeed, then we did open it, and that'll be all right. So I want to reset, I'll set the directory pointer to that. And I'll close the current one, is that we'll have two file handles for each directory that are open. If I want to clean everything up correctly, I can just have one open at a time, that'd be a little easier. So close just needs this pointer, so I can close this, and it's okay. If we open a new directory within the closed one, that's fine, that'll be all right. Because I've tested this before. <laughs> then we'll set it to the new directory just so we have one singular reference to the open one, we'll set the row, and then we'll do continue. And that should escape this and go back up here, which will clear the screen, set the position, position to zero in the new directory and read from there. So I think that'll be all right. So we can also set the name for the directory according to the file name. So we have the current directory name. So set path for current, say so set new path for current directory. And that's just dependent on really three things. If it's a dot, a dot, dot, or neither. And root doesn't have a parent, so that's okay. It does have a dot. So this is usually easier if you have like a string compare, but we can really just check if like the zeroth character is a dot and then a dot, dot, uh, the next character is a null. I could just do like a string compare though. That's what I'm used to doing. So string compare, file name with a dot, and we'll say two. Just include the null byte so we know it ends right there. And I'm not really going to do anything here. I'm not going to change the directory. I'm not going to put that on the name. I'll just do nothing. 
But the reason I do that is because a default case may have this fall under it, so I need to specify that regardless. Um, and I don't have a string in compare. I'll have to write that in a second, but that's all right. Else we have two dots, and we'll say three for that. Three 16 units for that. That is the parent directory. Go back up. Say current directory do nothing. Else we will go into nested directory. I mean, we'll we'll have already done this from opening the stuff up here, but just for the physical, the visual name at the top. Let's say continue overall loop and print new directory contents. Okay, entries. So the file name going back up. Let's say we have, we know the current directory string is in current directory. So I have something like, I have to make another thing. Let's say we have the last, the final slash and the name in that current directory. And I will search for the character, the slash. I'll get the final slash and name with string R character. And if it equals the position, I don't want to wipe it out. So let's say if it equals the current directory, I'll increment it and I'll set the value there to a null. So I'm basically finding the ending slash because I'm not going to end the directory overall with the slash. Uh, the root directory is a slash, but that's all right. So if we have something like, you know, folder A, folder B, or whatever, I'm not going to end the overall string with a, with a slash or anything over here. So I can find the final slash in the string, which will be here, and I can make it a null, thereby just having folder A being the full string. So we have gone up, technically, a directory. However, if it equals the, I'll say it equals the start, which that's an iffy way of doing that, but if it equals that, then it equals like the start. And we don't want to make that a zero because there won't be a string. I want to leave that as a slash, so I'll increment one and then make that a zero. So we're only left with the initial root directory slash. But I think those are the only two cases I have to handle there. There's only one case. And that's pretty simple. I do have to write those, those functions, but I'll do that in a second. Uh, going into a nested directory would be another function I can write if I want to make it easier, which is string cat. I, should, I would just be able to string cat the current directory and the new name onto the end of that, really, with a slash. So probably has to be a string, so we'll have a slash string, or s in printf, but that would be a little bit more complicated than doing this. And then after the string, we'll put the new name, which should be in file info, file name. And onto current string, okay. So I think that's all right. Hopefully, I just have to write these functions, which this will say implicit conversion and things, implicit declarations. Info filing is first use because it's file info. I called it I called it just plain info in another life, but not in this one. So that's what I'm trying to catch with this compiling right here. I probably did it everywhere. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll write these things. So string in compare, string r, char, and cat, which I have here. So let's just do that. Let's just say compare, is it un16? It's char 16. Sorry for putting you in. Char 16 string in compare. Compare two strings, each character, well, each unit, really. Up to length bytes. Returns, uh, I'll say difference in strings. That's, I don't know, last point of comparison. 
Actually, let's just, let me look this up. <laughs> it returns an int, okay. Int n would be the widest character. I guess I could do that. Character one, two, size n, it returns zero if they're equal, negative, less, positive if it's greater, and compared, only compares the first at most n bytes. Okay. Bytes at most, or up to, yeah, up to at most. So I would have, say, s1, s2, which are terrible names. And you went in as a size of equivalent here, or say n or length. Length makes more sense for me. So when comparison, let's have a colon. Say zero if strings are equal, less than zero. S2 is greater, greater than zero if S1 is greater. I think that's what it said. Okay. So I'll just say right off the bat, if length is zero, we can return zero. Otherwise, while length is greater than zero and the strings are valid, so while S1 and S2, while they're not null yet, and S1 equals S2, then we can just increment these and subtract here, just a simple while loop thing, and then after it's done, we know length is not zero because I had that check to begin with. Should be able to return S1 minus S2. While both strings are valid and not null, and they equal, and we have a length, we'll go along that length until we're done. Or one of the checks is done. Okay, that should be all right. So I called it string and compare. Let's end it with U16. So that's what I called it. Yep. Okay. So if not means it should return zero. And the other thing was what string cats and R char. String R character return last occurrence of uh, char c will also be 16 and string last occurrence of c and string so this will be a pointer so i don't know if it means like reverse or re-entrant or what it doesn't say what the r means does it probably here character means byte yeah mine will work with 16 bits it says terms. I guess it means like reverse or right. I never got a real meaning for the R there. But that's okay. So we'll have S1, her string, that we're searching in, and we'll have a, well, we'll have a character. I'll just say C, I guess. Because care is a fine word there. I'm also going to have a result. And yeah, we'll just set it to null by default. And I'll return that at the end. If we don't find anything, it'll be null. And that'll be likely because the string, the character won't occur within there, so that's okay. There's probably a version of this where you just return the null byte instead of just a null, but or the position of the null byte in the string. But I don't know. Anyway. Let's say while string. If the data at string equals C, then result will equal string and we'll add on to the string. Okay, that's a simple enough way of doing this because I've done that before, I think. So if we don't have the string, then we won't ever set result. That'll be all right. If we do have something in the string and it equals the character, we'll set that the result to that point in the string and increment. If it doesn't equal the character, then result will not be set again. So the last occurrence before the string is over, result will be set to that last occurrence. The first occurrence would just be like a leave at this point. Right, but the last occurrence we'd still it'd actually be within this. We do a leave. But anyway, the last occurrence is I think this. So that should be easy enough. Then I just had string cat. Stretching my brain here for these easy functions, but string cat would be 
concatenating concatenate string two onto the end of string one at its original null terminator position. That's my explanation for it. <laughs> Returns string one, although I think it's called source and dest for string cat as well. It is, okay. Onto the end of dest string at dest's original null terminator position. I think that's all right. Turns dest. Okay, and this will be string cat. So I've string r character, right? No. So I didn't put a suffix on that, u16. I'll do that for string cat as well. I'm just trying to think. This would find the last slash in there. Yeah, that should be all right. Okay. So string cat, u16. It's fairly simple as well. We'd have a dest and a source. String n cat would be better. I'm just used to string cat. I think string n cat also puts in a series of null bytes up until the original length as well. And I just don't want to deal with that right now with my brain. So this is simple enough. We can do a result again. Equal to the dest string. And then I can say while. We can return that at the end as well. Actually, no. We can return dest at the end. We can set something else. I don't know. P. Or S. I'll just say P. I don't know. It's not it's not good. It'd be a string, let's say S. Now we'll, re we'll return dest, but I don't want to mess with it because I'm going to be incrementing stuff later. So I can increment S instead for the original position. So while S, we can just increment, that'll get to the end of the string. Uh, say go until null terminator. And then while we have a source string. I should add another, I just realized I should add another cases where the string doesn't exist for these. But anyway, I guess that's why we have this. If it's set to null, then this wouldn't be true. So while we have a source string, then we can set s, the data at s, increment it equal to the data at source. And then probably should end it with a, end it with a null, right? A string cat end, end stuff with a null. I don't think it does. It returns a pointer to the terminating null byte of the copy string, string p copy. Otherwise, just this. No, I probably should. Because if I copy it onto the end, if that ends with null, I probably want to end it with a null. But string cat doesn't do that. So I'm trying to think if I can't, if I do this and this. We'll both end with a zero implicitly, so we'll go to there. And we do DOG. Source would not be there, so it would go on. So yeah, I probably want to end that with a null, right? That would make sense to me. But that's not what this does. I might change it to do that, though. <laughs> I guess that's what string ncat does. Concatenate a null padded character sequence. And they use string length and stuff as well. Returns dest. Null padded character sequence. Uh, I can say this is null padded by one and say it's not really C compliant, but that's fine. All right, so I'll do that. I'll null terminate it. And I'll terminate it for my, uh, my sanity here. We can check if that works by checking visually if it works, but I needed to implement those for the, uh, the directory to print. Value computed is not used. Mm -hmm. Oh, because I did equal. Yeah, that would make sense. 131 one. equal. And I'll go back down. Okay. All right, so if I go into a directory, it prints slash EFI, which is, I mean, yeah, that's not really what I wanted it, was it? <laughs> I guess that wasn't what I wanted. I know what I was trying to do, but okay, so dot doesn't do anything. Dot dot should go back up, and that doesn't work either, because I messed up the slash. 
Maybe I do need a slash on there. That doesn't make sense though. I probably need a special case here if we're at root. Probably that. So let's do that. Let's do 16, do position, character 16, equal current directory. Yeah. And I'll just say if. Uh, this is not a great way of doing that, but that's fine. If position equals slash, we'll just do plus plus, and then I'll just string cat onto position instead. Still adds a slash, really, dude? But it goes plus plus. <laughs> oh, no, what am I doing? What am I doing? I can do this. Or no, I can do what I did there. Yeah. If it doesn't equal, we just reverse it. Aha. Uh -huh. Just reverse the condition, my dude. If it doesn't equal, then we'll add a slash and then we'll add that. Uh, not at root. Add directory separator. You can tell I'm getting tired. <laughs> That's okay. There's always infinite, an infinite number of edge cases. There we go. Slash EFI. That doesn't do anything. Going back up on a Tuesday. The girl in the car, she ain't choose a directory. No, doesn't work. So that means this did not work. Bring our character should return the final thing. Should be a slash. If it equals, it would go plus plus. This should be, I guess this isn't correct. Maybe this isn't correct. Or the string in compare isn't correct, but it should be. Since this one is right and it didn't do anything, it should be one, two in the null byte. And if it equals the directory, we'll do plus plus because it's at root and I don't want to end that. Or I could, actually I could just increment regardless, maybe. That might be better. Maybe I'll do that. And then I'll set it to a null. Thinking, thinking here. No, it doesn't do anything. Okay, I have to debug that. Why does that not work? I'm gonna debug this for a second and I'll be back because my brain's not working. I need to take a little walk and get some more water. <laughs> okay, I figured out the issue. It was not <laughs> not comparing to the cursor row here, but to some you know arbitrary value that keeps track of which row we're on on the screen. Cursor row was not working because then I guess it would stop immediately when it reached the cursor row, and that would be before anything sort of got processed to go on here. So I can fix that by just saying, hey, I have a counter for whatever entry we're on, and until we reach the counter for the row that we're on, we're going to keep reading. If we're at the first directory entry, it'll stop immediately, but it will at least read that and then go on correctly. If we're below the first entry previously, this was not working because it would just equal whatever it's at and not go on. Anyway, this this works here. <laughs> the only other new stuff I did, other than the row comparison, is um, I'm just going to get rid of that because this works. If I just go past that, set it equal, really I could do this too. Be fancy with it. Um, but it was kind of simplifying this. Really, to check if we're at root or not, I just check if the second character is a null. And then I can just string cat. If we're not, if the second character is not a null, then we're at root, or sorry, if the second character is not a null, then we are not at root. If it is a null, then we're at just, you know, root with the null byte. Otherwise, we'll have like a folder and then a null byte, you know. A second character would not be null in that case, and we can put a slash in the next directory onto there. I don't need this other variable and stuff. That just overcomplicates things. So, okay. With those changes, semantically that one didn't change at runtime, but with those changes I can actually go back and forth now. Hey, dot doesn't do anything, dot dot goes up. If we go into the next one, hey, we get the next one. I can go dot dot dot. Okay, that one didn't work actually. Never mind. If I go too deep, I can go to one, but it leaves the slash. Ah, yes. It's not really what I wanted to do, but I guess that does work because I'm always, I'm always doing this. All right, so the only case in which I want to leave a slash is probably root. 
So what I can do there, instead of always incrementing here, is do what I had sort of originally. And that was if we're at the start, then I'll just increment. If we're at the start of the directory string, we're at the root slash, then I'll just move past that and then set a, a null byte there. Move past initial root directory slash, and then we'll null terminate. And that'll end the next name. Go back up and remove directory name from path. All right, that'll work. So if I go two directories deep, I go up one, I go up one, I can't go up anymore, that's fine. Okay, so now that I'm here, the last thing I'm probably going to do on this video, so it's not over too much over like two hours long, uh, if I press enter on a file, I want to print the file to screen. So let me do that. That's what we got down here. So that'll be a little bit more code, actually. We'll need to do read, which is fine. I can just set that up here directly initially here. Just copy where that was. I remember what I'm doing. So we need a buffer size and we need sort of the file info that we're reading into, probably. Which will just be which will be a generic buffer. So I can actually have a buffer. And we can either call get info or we already have the info within file info. So I want to print the contents, right? So let's say allocate buffer for file. I'll put that up there somewhere. We'll read file into buffer and we'll print the buffer. Print buffer contents. We'll do that. So I know read will read into a buffer. However big the buffer is, we can reuse buff size. That'll be all right. Just set it equal to the buffer, which is going to be, I think, void pointer pointer. Right? Oh, just a void pointer. So that's even easier, actually. If I make it a void pointer, we can just do that. Buff size is a pointer as well. They're all pointers. Okay. So that won't be too bad. So I have a buffer. I can make one here. I don't think I have allocate for anything, actually. No, I don't have allocate pages or pool. So pages would be in the page size of your system, probably four kilobytes for most people, for most things. I can allocate a pool, which would be regular byte granularity. So maybe I'll do that. And we'll set that up. I don't think my head's in the way, but. Move it up a little bit in case. That's probably going to be called EFI allocate pool if I was willing to guess to go along with free pool. I'll probably put it above free pool. But we'll do that. That would be under boot services, memory allocation, allocate pool. And I'll just move that back over. And. Just open it over here. So this will be allocate pool. So it allocates a pool of memory. That's all it really means. Some arbitrary size of memory, not just a fixed multiple of a given page size. I set a pointer to a pointer to a buffer the size that you want to allocate, and the type of memory, which I set up. Yeah, the enum up here, we're going to use probably loader data. Allocates pages as needed. Allocations are 8-byte aligned. Returned with free pool function. Pool type values in this range are OEM use. Define and allocate pages. I double click that. I looked at this earlier, but just to refresh. I probably need an allocate type as well. No, this just says pool type. I mean, for allocate pages, we need a type. I'll probably be using loader code or data. In general, we should allocate loader data. Service drivers must allocate boot services data. Runtime should allocate runtime services data. 
If we use pages and not pool for the allocate function, then any pages would be anything that satisfies. Max address would be up to a max address. Pointed to by memory on input. Allocate address, okay. Interesting. How we can allocate to a specific address, too. Oh, that's nice. Uh, then we have eCPI reclaim, which we could take later, I guess. Let's reform allocations for the following types. I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, so we can use loader, EFI loader data. That's what this is saying. We should allocate memory and pool of type loader data, so I will do that. I guess after I write it here. So we need pool type, copy that, pool type, size, and buffer. Okay, and that is a boot service, which actually I don't think I put that at the bottom, did I? I did put it right there. Okay, cool. So this would be allocate pool, the pool type. We're going to have EFI loader data. And then the size, and then the buffer. All right, banish that to the shadow realm. So the size is going to be a buffer size, which will be the size of the file. So we can probably just put the size of the file here, which would be info, file info. It would be file size. I think. Yeah, file size. A pointer to this buffer, which is a pointer, so it makes a double pointer. Okay, double star. Just set that to null, which I did not press shift there. There we go. And we can check the statuses and stuff as well. Might as well. Just get used to error handling literally everything we can. It's a good habit to get into for some things. Cannot allocate memory for file. S and S with file name, be status. Okay, that'll work. Otherwise, we did allocate, so I should free the pool when we're done. Probably do it at this point. Free memory when done. And that would just be calling. I don't really care about the status on that one. We'll just call free pool. For the buffer, which should be, I think, I think it would just be for the buffer. Just avoid pointer buffer. Okay. Okay, so we allocated a pool of data for it, so that's good. So we'll read the file into that buffer. The buffer would be buffer. Buffer size would be how big the file is, which would be file info dot file size. Assuming that worked. I suppose it would return the number bytes actually read. So let's say status we could not read read file s into buffer and I'll have another thing well does read return read returns a status it should return within the size so I actually might have to do the other variable for that because I think it's an in out yeah buffer size and it returns the number of data actually read in bytes yeah uh, so I can do that actually buff size will equal That's that pointer. Okay. So we got an error overall, else I want to check if we didn't read all the data and we need to know. I just want the user to know why, probably. If it didn't equal for some reason, maybe we have a, re a weird UEFI implementation. I don't know if it'll be an actual error, but I'll say it will be right now. All of file into buffer. Let's say bytes actually read I'll just say this we'll say bytes read will be percent I don't know you not J it'll be expected the other percent you that'll make sense that won't be a status error though yeah so the file name would be the first one and the bytes read would be buff size here, and the actual 
ones we wanted would be file size. Okay. All right, otherwise we have the buffer contents. Let's just make sure I get to this point. Make sure I'm not going too stir crazy here. We get to that point. So let's just, I want to read this disk image info file, which is written from my utility that just says how big the disk image is in bytes. And it couldn't read it for some reason. Probably this. Or this, could not allocate memory. I figure it would be loader data. Maybe this doesn't work because file info and I need to put the buffer there. That would make sense. That's probably maybe related. Allocate pool does not take a pointer, I don't think. No, it takes a uint, uint n size. Okay, maybe it's not a uint n. Buff size uint n should be. Yeah, it is. Okay. Let's just see if it's here or not. I should get key just so it'll stop on the screen. <laughs> I didn't think about that. It just goes on directly. I should make an overall error function that prints and then gets a key and goes on. That way I could simplify this. By simplify, I mean use less lines of code for errors, but okay. Let's see what that does. Where are we at here? Could not read all of file. Bytes read zero, expected 19. Okay. Good error reporting. So read does take a pointer. We did not get an error. I guess what am I reading? I'm not reading directory pointer, that's why. I'm not supposed to read directory pointer. <laughs> I'm supposed to read the, uh, the file itself, right? So this needs to be the file, the EFI file protocol thing. Probably. But isn't that what I opened? Oh, I didn't open it. I only opened the, uh, the directory. Now I understand. Now I understand, of course. Allocate buffer. Let's open file. Call it file. So directory open the file. Actually, no. Open because we needed this. And then we'll have, let's take a double pointer for open. Yes, for new handle. Yes, okay. We'll open the file name, open it for reading. That's fine. If status, we'll say could not open file. So I probably could deduplicate this. Not do this twice everywhere, but that's okay. All right, then we can read it in the buffer because we'll have the file here into that buffer. Got to open it first. I need to close it as well, but I want to make sure the open, the open worked. It went to here. Okay, that's good news. Best news I've seen all night. So I do want to close the file handle as well. I don't need status. Probably, I don't really care. But we'll close. I guess we just close the file. Yes, okay. I don't know if we had to pass the this for it or not, but no, we'll close it there. Okay, so to print it instead of here, actually probably we'll do this. But I'll do something like when we're done printing and we want to reload everything. So I press any key. To continue, dot, dot, dot. we'll get a key and then we'll go on after we free. Okay, because this goes back to the loop. Yep. Um, oh, I'm not calling close on the directory from escape either. Close last open directory. All right. Otherwise, that would keep a file handle open, which isn't necessarily bad. Firmware can probably handle that when we shut down the machine, but oh well. I'll do that just to clean up after myself. So how do you print the buffer contents to screen? Well, we have the buffer. 
I can say we grab stuff from that buffer, maybe. Character 16T thing. And we can read the bytes from that buffer and print them out, most likely. So let me do that. Let me print. Let's just do file contents. And on the next line, we'll print it out. Char 16T style, I guess, or maybe... No, because it might be ASCII. Usually my stuff outside of this is not Windows, it's not wide character. It's not wide character. Probably ASCII. I'll get a character pointer, and we'll just convert it probably. And I'll redo this in a second if it seems easier, but... I'll have two, um, make a string just in case, or we can have one and print a character. Maybe I'll do two. First one's gonna be null, or the second one, so we can have a null terminator for a string. But zero can equal position. And the ASCII characters will be, yeah, the same ones, because UTF-8 and 16 is cool like that. Just the second one of the pair is going to be a null. Okay. And then we'll say, I'll say, I guess, a character just to be safe. And that will be string. Or I can print S for the string and stop at the null, but I'll print C just so it takes one. Probably a, a bad and efficient way of doing it, but anyway. <laughs> we have the length, right, when we read everything in. Buff size has the length, and it equals the file size because this check or assertion didn't go off. I can do that. Let's so say while or four. Yeah, that's fine. We'll say bytes for lack of a better word. Bytes equals the buffer size greater than zero and minus minus. And that'll just give that. Just we'll print everything from the file. I guess position would have to increase as well. Position within the buffer for the next byte. And we'll see what that looks like. After we print everything, we can press any key. I'll do this one line after it, or even two lines. So we print everything out, and then we go down one. I'll see how that looks two lines after. Close file undeclared. What did I open then? <laughs> Yeah, file right there, dude. Directory pointer close that file. Is that not what it's called? Which undeclared identifier string zero equals star position. Do I have a missing semicolon or something somewhere, maybe? We open directory pointer for this thing. Mm. I would say that's not found. This is all within the same scope. I'm probably missing something very, very obvious here. 1335. That's way up here. That's why. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong spot. Yeah, I can't close this because it's not there. This would be a directory. The directory pointer is the open directory, not the file within the directory. I really should read what I'm doing as I'm doing it. So I'm going to char 16t makes a pointer from ints without a cast. That's true. Well, we can just cast our troubles away. Just cast your troubles away. What do you mean you don't like that? <laughs> from short unsigned int makes a point from it without a cast. What do you want me to do then? A pointer from int. Oh, because I'm doing a pointer to two. I'm doing two pointers. Yeah, I need to do an array of two characters. This is one character. This is another. I might not need to cast that if I do it that way. No. OK. Oh, sometimes things work. Obviously, here they don't because the file is blank. <laughs> Press any key to continue. I mean, that part works.
We read it into the buffer, yes. That's what the read did. Into the buffer, a buff size. That equals basically the buffer itself. The data at the position is in zero, one is in this. So maybe this isn't working, probably not. Do percent %s. See if the string works any better. Probably doesn't. Oh, the string works. Okay, so string instead of character. I might have stuff wrong with getting a character at a time. Because so it takes like an int, technically. But anyway. It prints the file contents. So I'll probably put another new line before then. But that file is written by my disk utility tool, by the UEFI GVT image creator thing that runs, that makes the whole disk image. It just saves a file within the file system here, diskimage.inf, all in the 8.3 naming. And the file contents are just a byte count of the size of the disk image itself. So I can use this later. I can write more files into the EFI system partition. And we can read the files and parse the contents because we have a buffer. We have a way to read into a buffer. So for the next video, I probably want to do that. I'll save files, either other files to the EFI system partition. Maybe I'll make a thing to write a file, just write a text file in here for another key press, for an example. But I'll probably move on to. Um, I'll probably read files still, but from the data partition, and that will not be using these file protocols because there's nothing just to read from blank data because we don't know what, what contents are there, what file system is there, if it doesn't have one, for example. So to read from some arbitrary place on the disk, there are protocols to do that, and they are block or, or disk I.O. protocols. I'll probably use block I.O. just be, because I'm used to thinking in terms of disk blocks and page sizes, so 4K at a time which is what block IO uses. The twos, I believe, are probably for asynchronous things with EX. Yeah. So asynchronous with disk tokens, which is probably better instead of doing everything blocking and synchronous. But disk protocol reads by bytes, I believe, for read and write. Read and write disk. They give you a media ID and stuff. Yeah, you get a starting byte offset and the size, the starting byte offset and the size in bytes, but it's not necessarily a multiple of the block size. Block IO protocol, just for read and write examples, and there's data associated with these things too. Describing the block device. Block IO read takes a starting LBA or logical block address, and the size in bytes must be a multiple of the block size. So I'll probably use block IO protocol and get the size in 4K chunks and read, you know, 4K chunks of data for stuff. So if we make a, like an example file, text file, or something like a program, maybe a kernel, which can just do something simple, like write something, or we don't have a font or anything, I have to set that up. Um, if I pass the frame buffer for the GOP to an example kernel, we can draw to the GOP in the frame buffer and just draw something to screen to prove that, hey, we loaded a file as a kernel, and we can draw to it. And then we can go on to exit boot services and do other fun stuff. But I can write that kernel to the data partition. I mean, I could write it to the EFI system partition as well. The reason I'm writing it to the data partition is so we can have some arbitrary amount of space. You can make that as large as you need to, not just limited to the EFI partition size, for example. But we'll get stuff like the media. Uh, we'll, I'll probably use locate handle buffer to get all the block IO protocols and then just go through those and try to parse them out according to what I'm expecting my disks to look like. And there's different data in here you can use for that, kind of. It's kind of jank. I mean, it'd be better to get, like, the issue is this This is abstracted to where we don't know if it's an AHCI SATA disk or NVMe or a USB or something. I don't know. We just know how big it is, pretty much, and the media ID the firmware gives us. But you can return the size of the, the block. You can return the size of the disk, effectively. And, you know, the user can parse that and say, you know, I know this disk is 128 gigs, so it's probably this one. I mean, that's not great. I should use like an identify command for ATA or something. But I don't know what all I have connected at any arbitrary point in time. I might have a USB connected that I want to write to. I might have an NVMe drive. And you can abstract all of them with, you know, block IO protocols and such. But it's not as great for identification, unfortunately. So I might research that a little bit more anyway. But at least as far as this video, it's, it's going on too long. 
Um, and I need to head off, but I mean, if you're interested in what arbitrary data looks like, it looks like garbage, <laughs> right? For non-volatile variables. I mean, you could get some stuff in here. We have attention, we have initial attempt order and boot order variables. That's cool. QEMU hard disk. You know, I have a, the EFI file itself is going to be a bunch of just garbage. Although at the end, we see where strings are linked in, maybe a global string table or something. So they have all my variable names at the end here, as well as some other things like BSS and runtime pseudo relocation list ending. So that's interesting. So you could conceivably make an XXD or similar binary, I don't know, investigator <laughs> utility. But for text files, it's pretty easy. And I will be using this disk, disk size in the future to attempt to write a bootloader in which I will load this disk image and write it to another disk using block IO protocol, which is another segue into that. So um, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. If you want to see writing a file, I can add that. And if I don't do it on the next one, then I'll probably do it in the future. But if you want to see writing a file instead of reading, that's easy enough. It's just an input loop from the user and then writing like a character at a time or something to a file that we opened, but the open would have a different open flag. It would be like create, and then you would fill in the attributes at the end instead of zero. It would be something like um, directory or file or something. But anyway, yeah, that's all I got for this. I know I should record these not at night at the end of the week, but it's when I have time to do so. So anyway, I'm talking too much. Sorry. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one. I'm going to enjoy some... Uh, I don't even know what type this is. A Riesling? I don't know. It's a white wine. <laughs> Pretty sweet, though. But anyway, cheers. I'll see you then.